Do you believe this is some form of escalation then? Well, we have to put it into a little bit of context. Boko Haram has been targeting Cameroon for some time. Back in May of 2014, they kidnapped uh, 10 Chinese construction workers. In July, they, they went so far as to kidnap the wife of the deputy prime minister. Uh, both the Chinese workers and the deputy prime minister's wife were subsequently released in exchange for release of Boko Haram prisoners, even weapons, and the payment of a rather large cash ransom. So these attacks are not new. What is new is the scale. And the scale is clearly intended to send a message as well as to serve Boko Haram operationally, sending a message that it will expand and is a threat to the region, following up on its explicit threat to Cameroon's President Paul Biya last month. And also operationally, these captured uh, prisoners, if they're not ransomed, can be used either as uh, slaves or soldiers or unwilling suicide bombers, as we've seen recently in Nigeria, where children as young as 10 years old were used to carry explosives into crowded settings. Why now, though? What about the timing of it all? Well, I think several reasons. One is Boko Haram has more or less reached uh, a certain limit to what it can do in Nigeria. It sees a large area of territory, larger than the size of Belgium, uh, but it's unable to take Maiduguri, the capital of Borno State, that's simply too large for it. They can attack and has been attacking. So it's time to expand where it can expand, where it sees a soft target. And certainly the poorest borders with Niger, with Chad and Cameroon provide targets of opportunity. It's also following through on its threat. It's threatened these countries. And what one thing we've learned about Abu Bakr Shakao, the leader of Boko Haram, is he doesn't make threats idly. His threats are often dismissed, but he actually does follow through. And in this particular case, he threatened Paul B. of Cameroon uh, and served notice, and he's now following through on that. What can the international community do to help? Well, I think what we need to do first and foremost is recognize the scale of the problem. This is not the Boko Haram of five years ago or even two or three years ago. This is a full-fledged insurgent movement that is capable of holding large amounts of territory and beating well-armed conventional forces. Nigeria, after all, has the largest defense budget in all of Africa, and yet it's unable to beat back, and in fact is beaten back by Boko Haram. Secondly, it's a problem that spreads far beyond Nigeria. The neighbors are affected, and the neighbors are, in many cases, far more fragile than Nigeria. And so the international community needs to support not only Nigeria, but also its neighbors containing the problem and eventually, hopefully, rolling it back. Who is backing Boko Haram, then? Where are they getting their funding from and their strength from? Well, their, their strength, one could argue, is driven by the marginalization of northeastern Nigeria. Nigeria's north is lags behind its south on almost every measure of socioeconomic well-being, and the northeast lags even farther behind. So there are grievances that predispose uh, or set things up for an insurgency. But it doesn't cost that much to run an insurgency in this region. Uh, Boko Haram has the resources both from its criminal rackets and increasingly from the payment of ransoms. Uh, I mentioned earlier the kidnappings from Cameroon. Those have netted, uh, last year netted Boko Haram in excess of probably half a million dollars. The year before, an even larger ransom was paid for a French family. And then there are more ordinary people who are kidnapped, people who aren't international, aren't expatriates. So they're, they're not going to draw the huge ransoms, but they draw modest ten. $20,000 for each from their families. And so uh, several hundred of these kidnappings occur every year. So Boko Haram has a more than uh, adequate funding stream for its operations, unfortunately.